Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Rashmi Jain and I am working as a guest faculty in the Department of English and Modern European Languages. Today I will speak about Feminist Literary Agency. The paper is originally written by Ms. Aroma Kharshing from the English and Foreign Languages, University of Lucknow. It is a well known fact that from the beginning of human civilization, the world of literature has been dominated by male writers and women's writing was excluded from the mainstream culture and literature. Women were actively discouraged from pursuing literary ambitions by patriarchal structures of society that played a key role in concising a subordinate status to women and limiting their role and uh, making them and making them inclusively to childbearing and child rearing. For women, writing became the most effective strategy for self-expression and the creation of their unique and autonomous identity. It became the means of the portrayal of the struggles that shaped their lives. Finally, it also became the harbinger of social and political change and the medium for exploring the possibilities of creating alternative structures of gender relations in society. There are many critics who claim that women's writing is a distinctive artistic genre that is endowed with its own unique perspective, style, theme and tradition. Since Virginia Woolf declared that a woman book is not written as a man would write it. Women writers and theorists have endowed to rewrite not only the rules of what can be said in literature but how it can be said in order to express the idea. The lost tradition of women's writing was retrieved and developed primarily within American feminist literary criticism since the 1970s. After the appearance of Mary Ellman's Thinking About Women which came in 1968 and Kate Millett's Sexual Politics which came in 1969, some of the other influential works of the later half of the 1970s include Aileen Shaw Alters, A Literature of Their Own which came in 1977 and Sandra Gilbert and Susan Goober's The Mad Woman in the Attic. With the publication of Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, which came in 1929, was the most influential work of that time and it garnered and generated critical interest about women's writing. Woolf was an acclaimed modernist writer of 20th century, laid the building blocks of the nascent and she also uh, said about the critic on women authors. Virginia Woolf was the first feminist theorist to suggest a distinctive style of women's literature when she urged women to explore the possibility of forging their own distinct style and form of writing that is free from patriarchal values which devaluate women writer. A Room of One's Own by Woolf was originally written for a lecture that she was invited to deliver at Gitton College, Cambridge in 1928 on women and fiction. The treatise takes up the charge of inferiority leveled against women in general and women writers in particular and presents a powerful materializing analysis on women oppression. Wolf further emphasizes that artistic genius is not a miraculous gift that one is born with, rather it is a talent that develops among the educated and leisured class when two important criteria are fulfilled. The first criteria is that a room of one's own which is symbolic of independent space for women as an individual and second is another important factor that is the financial independence. Wolf's concept of androgyny suggests that 
Though the physical body is divided into two sexes, it is possible for the mind to contain the characteristics of both. She was also further inspired by a romantic poet, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's notion that the mind of a creative genius is androgynous, since the creativity of the true artist is powered by the harmonious fusion of feminine and masculine traits in the mind. Wolf's notion of androgynous mind remains a till date controversial topic. Some prominent theorists like Aline Showalter, Mary Daly, Lisa Rado, and Julia Kristeva dismiss Wolf's notion of androgyny. Moore's Literary Woman, which came in 1976, was one of the earliest works that separated women from the mainstream literary history to underscore a better understanding of women's literary history. Her work is one of the earliest feminist projects that charts a literary history of women compiled from letters, private correspondences and books written by women authors to examine the fact that how women are influenced both by their lives and writing. It concentrates mainly on the works done by women. Moose emphasizes that women's writing was a subversive, rapid and powerful undercurrent distinct form that not only drew from women's unique experiences but also a secret literary subculture of women, often unnoticed by the mainstream literature. She also argued that the knowledge of feminist literary history was necessary for a sound understanding of women's writing. Another major theorist that is Aline Shue Alter. Aline Shue Alter is an American feminist who conceptualized the notion of gynocriticism in her essay Towards a Feminist Poetics, which came in 1979. It is considered as an alternative to Virginia Woolf's principle of androgyny for women writers. It became a new critical framework for the interpretation of women's literary history. Gynocriticism is the historical study of the texts written by women that privileges their feminine experience, which distinguishes it as a unique literary tradition. Schuhalter claims that women's writing are profoundly different from men's writing because women write from their unique female experiences, their life experiences. In her work, A Literature of Their Own, she deals with the history of women's writing. In A Literature of Their Own, Schuhalter traces the evolution of the female literary tradition from Victorian period to, the, to that of modern period and divides them into three stages that are the feminine stage, the feminist stage and the female stage. First, the feminine stage spanned a period of 40 years beginning in 1840s up to 1880 and includes women writers such as Bronte sisters, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Elizabeth Gaskill and George Eliot. This phase was a phase of imitation since these women writers imitated the dominant male structures of literary styles and form. Second, the feminist phase shows the evolution of female tradition span which spanned for nearly four decades beginning in 1882 up to 1920. The period witnesses the rise of suffragette movement that is right to vote and demands for the equal rights for women and thus was marked by protest against the male centered literary traditions. Writers like Mary Bredon, Mona Kidd, Sarah Grand were some of the important writers of this phase. Third, the third stage that is the female phase is an ongoing stage that began in 1920. This last stage is a period of self-discovery and freedom. Shoalta further divides this phase into two sections. The first half of the female phase, Shoalta 
classifies writers like Dorothy Richardson, Catherine Mansfield and Virginia Woolf. This early stage of female phase was characterized by legacy of feminine self-hatred and feminist withdrawal that influenced the authors and shows their inner subconsciousness of mind. The second half of the female stage begins in 1960 and the writers who wrote in this phase are Iris Murdoch, Muriel Spark and Doris Lessing who transgressed boundaries and rules of proper stuff of fiction. They utilized their anger against patriarchy and vocalized female physical experiences as a source of female creation. Showalter advanced a new theoretical framework for feminist criticism that she called gynocriticism in her seminal essay Towards a Feminist Poetics. In this essay, Showalter outlines two modes of feminist criticism, the ideological which is concerned with women as readers and consumers of literature written by men. This criticism critiques the misinterpretations and stereotypical image of women in the literature written by men. The second mode of feminist criticism focuses on women as writers or what Showalter calls gynocriticism and it is the criticism concerned with women as a writer and producer of literary texts. Its exclusive focus is on the history, style, theme, genres and structures of writing by women. Showalter then goes on to present four models that have been used by current feminist criticism to analyze literature written by women. These models are biological, linguistic, psychoanalytic and cultural. The biological model rejects the patriarchal notion of women's biological inferiority. It also emphasizes how the female body is repository of artistic creativity and imagery that women writers can tap into for literary inspiration. Women writers also follow this to portray their candor, intimate experiences of the female body such as menstruation, pregnancy and childbirth. Second is the linguistic model which shows the difference that is primarily concerned with whether men and women use language differently when writing literary texts. It analyzes whether factors such as biology, social and cultural norms and values influence the language preferred by men and women. The third is the psychological model which explores the connection between the psyche and the crea creative process. It attempts to identify gender differences in the creative mind as well as the creative process. The fourth model suggested by her is the cultural model that incorporates the notions of biological, linguistic and psychological models and locates them in a particular socio-cultural context within the texts are written. This approach acknowledges the differences among women along the lines of race, class, nationality and geography and they study how these factors affects women's writing. Shoalter's gynocriticism has been criticized by some Marxist feminists like Gail Green and Torel Moy. Torel Moy in her sexual textual politics which was uh, published in 1985 accuses Shoalter of ignoring the urgency of challenging capitalism and fascism and upholding an implicit belief in the values of traditional bourgeois humanism of a liberal individualist kind that according to Moy is the representative of patriarchal ideology. Another important theorist in this connection is Sandra Gilbert and Susan Goober's 
they in their work the mad women in the attic gained immense popularity as a classic text of the second wave feminist literary criticism it focused on the recovery of distinct female literary tradition and developing a theory of female literary responses to male literary dominance their work focuses on the major anglo american female writers of the 19th century who brings light to the struggles that these authors had to face in order to validate themselves or to establish themselves as authors according to gilbert and guber women authors in the 19th century fought against all the odds to overcome the anxiety of authorship they refute sexist criticisms of inferiority labeled against their works and recover the lost tradition of literary foremothers in the search for forging a distinctive female aesthetics in their works the burden that female authors had to deal with was twofold first they had to battle such patriarchal myths of creativity and secondly they had to measure up what simon de beauvoir calls the idea of the eternal feminine a combination of traits deemed essential for all women such as physical beauty docility passivity and selflessness the frozen angel in the house this concept took pre- precedence in the novels of the 19th century she was shadowed by her dark twin a prototype of which can be found in the destructive and the transgressive sorceress goddess mythic figures such as kali phinx and medusa such transgressive figures allowed women writers both to seduce and steal main generative energy gilbert and guber claimed that such dark figures were the split image of the female authors own rage and anxiety and it is through such dark alter images that women authors simultaneously confirmed as well as challenged the prevalent norms of femininity and female creativity hazel carby's reconstructing womanhood in the emergence of afro american women novelist came in 1970 came in 1987 is a path breaking work that sought to build an alternative african american women's literary tradition it is a critical exploration of racism implicit in the discourses of womanhood and literary criticism on women's literary productions in the 19th century the work analyzes how black women are not considered as women since the racism since the racism implicit in discourses of womanhood and modeled on a cult of true womanhood that was predominantly white the cult of womanhood in the 19th century cultural construct that was informed by notions of beauty chastity piety domesticity submissiveness that was essential to the conception at that time which was in turn defined in oppression of black women in india critical engagements with the hidden political biases of anglo american feminism in the arena of women's writing is best exemplified in sushi tharu and k lalita's two volume publication entitled women writing in india 600 bc to the present tharu and lalita pointed out that the patriarchy is not universal but constituted by historically contingent factors such as class caste race and the experiences of colonialism in order to conclude it can be said that they also put forward the portrayal of women in india not as metaphor of nationhood or extension of an authentic indian identity but as an endeavor to impel western academia's perception of indian feminist criticism beyond what forbes calls an orientalist construction of the downtrodden indian women 
to a mature corpus of feminist scholarship that is critically aware of how categories such as class, caste, race, ethnicity, historical, social context interact with them to determine the production of female writing. Thank you so much.